evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about dyslexia. We're going to talk about misconceptions. We're going to talk about some ways of, of teachers helping children with dyslexia in the classroom, some of the methods that we use at the bridge. But it is all part of what we like to term neurodiversity at our school. That's the approach we follow. And if you remember from last time, we've, this is the third one in the series. We've spoken about anxiety. We spoke about neurodiversity in general. And last time we spoke about all of these aspects of neurodiversity, which we might find at our school. And there was quite a demand to talk a little bit more about dyslexia. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We don't have all the answers. We're not experts across the board, but we would like to give a general overview of how things work. And as I said, misconceptions, ways of diagnosing, if you like, and we're going to look at that. Take a moment to read the following. How was that? Frustrating? Slow? What were those sentences about? They're actually a simulation of the experience of dyslexia, designed to make you decode each word. Those with dyslexia experience that laborious pace every time they read. When most people think of dyslexia, they think of seeing letters and words backwards like seeing B as D and vice versa, or they might think people with dyslexia see saw as was. The truth is, people with dyslexia see things the same way as everyone else. Dyslexia is caused by a phonological processing problem, meaning people affected by it have trouble not with seeing language, but with manipulating it. For example, if you heard the word cat and then someone asked you, remove the C, what word would you have left? at. This can be difficult for those with dyslexia. Given a word in isolation like fantastic, students with dyslexia need to break the word into parts to read it. fan tas tic Time spent decoding makes it hard to keep up with peers and gain sufficient comprehension. Spelling words phonetically like s-t-i-k for stick and f-r-e-n-s for friends is also common. These difficulties are more widespread and varied than commonly imagined. Dyslexia affects up to one in five people. It occurs on a continuum. One person might have mild dyslexia, while the next person has a profound case of it. Dyslexia also runs in families. It's common to see one family member who has trouble spelling, while another family member has severe difficulty decoding even one-syllable words like catch. The continuum and distribution of dyslexia suggest a broader principle to bear in mind as we look at how the brains of those with dyslexia process language. Neurodiversity is the idea that because all our brains show differences in structure and function, we shouldn't be so quick to label every deviation from the norm as a pathological disorder or dismiss people living with these variations as defective. People with neurobiological variations like dyslexia, including such creative and inventive individuals as Picasso, Muhammad Ali, Whoopi Goldberg, Steven Spielberg, and Cher, clearly have every capacity to be brilliant and successful in life. So here's the special way the brains of those with dyslexia work. The brain is divided into two hemispheres. The left hemisphere is generally in charge of language and ultimately reading while the right typically handles spatial activities. fMRI studies have found that the brains of those with dyslexia rely more on the right hemisphere and frontal lobe than the brains of those without it. This means when they read a word, it takes a longer trip through their brain and can get delayed in the frontal lobe. Because of this neurobiological glitch, they read with more difficulty. But those with dyslexia can physically change their brain and improve their reading. With an intensive, multi-sensory intervention that breaks the language down and teaches the reader to decode based on syllable types and spelling rules, the brains of those with dyslexia begin using the left hemisphere more efficiently while reading, and their reading improves. The intervention works because it locates dyslexia appropriately, as a functional variation in the brain, which naturally shows all sorts of variations from one person to another. 
neurodiversity emphasizes this spectrum of brain function in all humans and suggests that to better understand the perspectives of those around us, we should try to not only see the world through their eyes, but understand it through their brains. Right, I think that person explained it far better than I could. And it's very interesting. And the word that I take from that is the word glitch. It's, it's, it's a really good word because we, I think we all understand glitch as something that it's there and it's a slight problem and we deal with it and we move forward. It might be there for a long time, but we cope with it. So I like the word glitch. So let's have a look. That's, there's a definition of dyslexia. And again, the important part, if you read through that, neurobiological in origin. A lot of people don't understand that and they think and they have misconceptions and we'll get to those. But really, that's what it's about. And these are some of some of the areas that we might find or diagnose with, with little guys when, when we come across them and we see these problems. So the first one, phonological processing, a lot to do with the sound and attaching a sound to a letter and rapid naming, working memory. Working memory is interesting because often we, for a short time, retain information and the moment we move away from that particular activity, we forget what we were doing and that working memory just goes away. But for little guys with dyslexia, that working memory is a real problem. They don't even retain the information for the short time while we're working on the particular exercise or activity. So it's, a, it's another way of, of, of spotting that there may be a problem. And then difficulties with processing speed. Processing speed meaning exactly that, how fast, and you saw from the video before, how fast can a person proceed, process the thing that they're busy with? And again, these little guys with, with dyslexia, they will always battle with that processing speed. It's, it's going to be one of the, the ways of, of um, recognizing these problems. So let's, that video, I think, explained it pretty well, but let's see, this lady has some other ideas and, and, and really good ideas in terms of also some interventions. Let's watch what she says. We've learned so much about what dyslexia is and isn't. We know it's a brain-based condition that impacts reading, spelling, and writing, but it's not a problem with vision. Dyslexia is a problem with understanding and working with language. Dyslexia is a lifelong issue that tends to run in families, so there's often a parent or a sibling who also has it. And brain imaging studies have shown us that there are differences in how the brain is structured and how it functions in people who have dyslexia. But it's important to know that dyslexia has nothing to do with intelligence. Children with dyslexia are just as smart as other children. We can see signs of dyslexia even before children learn to read. Reading is a complicated process that starts with being able to recognize individual sounds in words. Take the word elephant. Most children at a young age can recognize three parts in that word, elephant. But the child with dyslexia might not hear that fint is actually made up of four different sounds, f, i, n, t. They may only hear one or two. Reading and spelling are hard for kids with dyslexia because first they have to hear those individual sounds and then they have to understand that each of those sounds is represented by one or more letters. Children with dyslexia usually have difficulty with this basic language skill, which is called phonemic awareness. So you might see your child having trouble with rhyming or isolating the sounds in words. That makes it difficult for your child to match letters to their sounds, like knowing that S sounds like S or that SH sounds like SH. This skill is called decoding, and children use it to sound out words. We know a lot about what can help children with these skills. The most important thing is specialized reading instruction. A well-known approach is called Orton-Gillingham. It helps children to learn to break words down into their component sounds, match the sounds to letters, and then blend those sounds together. Reading programs based on Orton-Gillingham use multi-sensory techniques. So children might trace letters in sand while saying that letter in its sound, or clap out syllables in words. These methods are proven to be effective. There are also tools like audiobooks, 
text-to-speech software and reading apps that can help children with dyslexia. You can help your child at home by reading aloud together every day. Choosing books that tap into your child's passions can help develop an interest in reading. Playing rhyming games, reading nursery rhymes, and singing songs can also be a fun way to help younger children build early reading skills. It's important to know that even though children don't outgrow dyslexia, they can become skilled readers and strong learners. With the right support, they can succeed in school and in life. Again. Very well said by the lady in terms of defining what it is that we're trying to work on and the interventions that we need to make. So the next part I'd like to look at is rather to do with the misconceptions because I think that's across the board and I'm a much older person. Over the years, people have really had their own ideas of what is dyslexia and what, what it isn't. So let's look at some of the possible misconceptions as we go along and we we will answer the question. So the first one, intelligent people cannot be dyslexic or have a learning disability. Some of these answers, some of these questions were already answered in the two videos, but let's see. So first one, intelligent people cannot be dyslexic or have a learning disability. I think we're all pretty clear on the fact that no, dyslexia and intelligence are not connected. Many dyslexic individuals are very creative and have accomplished many incredible things as adults. And I think one of the videos even showed that. So it is interesting, but no, they are not connected. Uh, and, and that's a thing that I've, I'm at pains to, to make people understand sometimes or help people to understand because they really do believe that if you're dyslexic, you're not bright. And that's not the case. It's really not the case. Um, you may not be a strong reader, but you may be very bright and probably are. Dyslexia is rare. And I think one of those videos showed uh, a graphic of where maybe one in five people had dyslexia, which would be 20%. So. Research across the world says it can vary from 10 to 17 percent. And even in that video, it was quite clear that there are different forms of dyslexia, sometimes very mild, sometimes much more severe. It, it depends. But but if you think of that figure, that's quite a lot. Even 10 percent, that's one in 10 people. Yeah, 20 percent, that's a lot. One in five people. So we should be aware of the fact that many, many people suffer from dyslexia in some other form, maybe a mild form and sometimes a much more severe form. And at our school, at the bridge, we, we really need to be aware of these things and identify them fairly early. Let's have a look. Next one. Dyslexia can be outgrown. What do you think? Can it be outgrown? Um, is it just a thing that you have when you're two, three, or four, or five, or six, or seven years old, and then you learn to read and you're fine and it can be outgrown? Well, I'm sure we're quite aware that many, many adults will tell you that they've battled this dyslexia their entire lives. And it is a lifelong issue and it will continue into adulthood. But Many people learn to read well, uh, accurately, probably, uh, continue to, but they, they'll probably read slowly, not automatically. And if they have a choice, they would rather not read something. And so be it. And even at school, we did a little, little workshop where we spoke about what about adults with dyslexia? What happens? Can you be a fine, normal adult and carry on your life and achieve many things? And, and yes, you can. There's no question. You probably wouldn't choose something where you meant to do reading every single day of your life, but you can, and it can be a part of of the world that, that you tackle. Let's have a look at another one. Um, this one's an interesting one, and many schools and many teachers even, and, and lots of people would say that you can't diagnose it until after grade three, you're not sure. And the reason for that, let's have a look at whether that's true or not, but it's not true because you can already, long before that, you can already probably make assumptions as you go along, Different different signs will come up. A little person will battle with their reading and spelling, and that we start in grade one anyway. Sometimes even grade grade R, and they'll be struggling and struggling and struggling. And I think the misconception comes in because probably after grade three is where now the child really battles to read or battles to spell, and and now it's a much bigger issue. But it could have been diagnosed a long time before that, and probably should be because the sooner we start helping a child with some of these issues, the, the better they will be in terms of their reading skills and spelling skills as we go along. What about that one? Dyslexia is not genetically based. So we like to think that that's not the case. Um, Bruce Fordyce was a runner back in the day and he ran comrades and he won many times. Only older, older people will know who he is, but great athlete. And the one thing that he always said, he just liked every speech he, he gave in those days was about, I'd like to thank my mom and dad for the genes they gave me. And, and it was always like that because he felt without genetically based skills that he was given, he may not have achieved what he did. So 
the same with dyslexia. It is genetically based. Very often, children, parents have battled with these kinds of things, and often their children battle. The positive side of that is that if you've battled as a child and you know you've battled, your child battling, you'll identify that a lot sooner and possibly get the right interventions and help for them. So that, that's the positive side of a parent having suffered or battled with some of these some of these issues. But yes, it is definitely genetically based. Let's have a look at a couple more. If you don't teach a dyslexic child to read by the age of 9 or 10 or 11, whatever, it's too late for them to ever learn how to read. And that's, again, not true. Always, always we can improve reading, spelling, writing for someone dyslexic, and that can be even an adult. There are many, many adults that really learn to read well only as adults. It's almost like they have the confidence to try then, which they didn't have when they were younger. So definitely it's never too late. And obviously earlier, better, but never too late. What about that one? This is one that people will often say to me, people with dyslexia see things backwards. And I suppose it starts because of reversal of letters, B's and D's and so on, and it's kind of backwards. So people get the feeling that that is why that person would be dyslexic. But it's not often the case. It's one of the diagnostic features probably, but not in itself. And the reason for that is that people have, all the research has shown that dyslexia is not about visual perception or problems with the eyes or visual acuity. It's not that at all. It's got a lot of other features. And they don't see, don't see things backwards. People have asked me before, what about backward writing? I don't know if you've ever seen a child who can write their name backwards and they do things backwards and completely, the, in, or the, whole, the whole word, and so-called mirror writing. And then they say, well, is that child then obviously dyslexic? Not the case. Again, there'll be other reasons why that, that would be so. But if a child continues to do that and cannot learn other methods and doing things differently, then, then maybe it would be one of the features of, of dyslexia. People with dyslexia cannot read. Now you think about that in, in adult life, it's every single day you're forced to read something. You have to fill in a form somewhere. You have to do something in these days with everything online. You need, need sometimes there's symbols and pictures, but very often you need to read. So I would say even people with, with fairly severe dyslexia have taught themselves possibly, older people, to read and they can read. And then different interventions have helped them to read pretty well. So again, Incorrect. Most people with dyslexia are able to read. They may battle. And if they battle to spell as they go on more and more and more, uh, age 8, 9, 10, then yes, would be a red flag for, for dyslexia. And then you can see, as one of those videos showed you about decoding of language and how we use different parts of language or syllables to, to decode and to, to use it. And it's one of the methods that teachers would use to help a child who battles with, with dyslexia. So another statement, every child who struggles with reading is dyslexic. Again, not the case. Many children would battle with reading for other reasons. Sometimes it would be visual perceptual problems or other problems like that, but not necessarily dyslexia. So as, as you can see there, children battle with, with sometimes spoken language and to convert spoken language into written language, they battle with that, which is not necessarily dyslexia. But yes, at the end of the day, if problems continue and continue and continue, and yes, if reading and spelling remains a problem, then, then probably most likely that children will have some form of dyslexia on, on, on a scale. Any child who reverses letters or numbers has dyslexia. And again, similar answer to before. It's quite normal for children to actually reverse Bs and Ds and, and numbers sometimes when they're little. And that's got a lot to do with other reasons. One of the reasons that I used to find as a, as a psychologist in private practice and testing a lot of children was concentration. So a child would, would not be focused and not concentrating. And instead of looking at a B, he'd just be rushing and not focused and not concentrating and say a D or, or write a D instead of a B. And when he was focused and concentrating a lot better, then he would get it correct. So it was very inconsistent. Whereas a person has real dyslexic problems will probably make errors across the board with its spelling or, or reading and for a long time. But for a little child, very often they'll make those errors, but they will be fixed and by very soon. And by the end of grade one, they won't probably won't make those, those, those reversals anymore. Reversals are one of the diagnostic criteria, but, but not in themselves enough to say, if you reverse your BND, you have dyslexia. It's certainly not the case. And this one, we find this a lot at school. Children with dyslexia are just lazy. And, and obviously that's not the case. I've worked with many, many children who work very hard overcome some of these issues 
they really try they work harder than an average child works in order to overcome some of the problems so it's certainly not about laziness where this misconception probably comes in is where a child has built up a negativity about reading or spelling or writing and they'd rather not try they'd rather not if they don't try they go and fail so they'd rather not try then and then a teacher or somebody might interpret that as a child just uh, being lazy and not, and not making any effort but it's not the case and, and most times children with dyslexia work really hard to try and overcome some of the issues and we as teachers need to be very aware of, of, of the fact that that's the case so you saw that thing about the uh, reversal of, of, of numbers if you there it is dyscalculia uh, that's more than just reversal of, of, of numbers it will be persistent persistent difficulty so not just preschool or grade one persistent difficulties with numbers manipulation of numbers or making calculations or battling with that and sometimes you'll find a child who can actually read pretty well but battles with numbers and then you're really confused because it's not dyslexia and then it's this it's dyscalculia it's it's, it's just another form of, of of probably dyslexia but it's to do with numbers uh, at our school we had a little workshop a couple of weeks ago where teachers worked on dyscalculia how to cope with children with with these kinds of problems and I think it's vital but it isn't dyslexia in itself it can be another thing and then another related issue dysgraphia persistent difficulties with with handwriting being able to write and then obviously spelling being able to you you you, you can you can say the word but you can't write the word or spell the word that'll be dysgraphia across the board so it's related to to dyslexia but it's not entirely dyslexia it's, it's sometimes children can read but then battle with the spelling or battle with the writing and then it'll be more just dysgraphia so again it's something to look at the handwriting is quite a problem back in the day they used to even give us a mark at school for your handwriting so if you if you wrote really well you'd get a really good mark for handwriting so you could bring up your marks just by writing neatly so i'm glad that's not part of our syllabus anymore but our little grade threes at our school, a big event in their lives was to get their pen license. And in order to get their pen license, they had to be able to write pretty neatly, they had to copy things, they had to write sentences. And one little person at our school really battled with that. And he came to see me and he was struggling and he was worried about the fact that he wasn't going to get his pen license. And at our school, we even make certain accommodations. Sometimes children can work on, on, on iPads and type things. But this little guy was persistent and he really, really wanted to get his pen license. And he worked really hard. And if you ask him today, he'll tell you one of his proudest moments was getting his pen license. Uh, it's a little certificate and it's signed. And, and he felt really proud of that. And I was proud of him that he persisted and he didn't just take the easy way out and, and sometimes use, you know, um, some of the accommodations that he could have. Um, but yeah, that's it's very important. But it's that would be dysgraphia rather than dyslexia, possibly. So what's very important are what are the interventions because we can talk all night about what the definitions are misconceptions but it's it's much more about what we do in the classroom how can we help children with dyslexia what will we do uh, at, at our school we were a small school but we need to help every child and remember at the beginning we spoke about neurodiversity and strength in some areas we can in other areas we need to be able to help all these little guys with whatever their problems are. And tonight we're talking about dyslexia so the first one is a, is, a, is a big part of it. Um, every teacher that works with these little guys has to be able to work with those sounds. So we're talking about phonological, phonemic um, skills. Very important to work with the sounds, relate the sounds to letters, be able to work, break the, the, the words down into, into their parts, into syllables. And they will talk people, a lot of people across the world will talk about reading and what's important, oral language, saying the words, saying the sounds, phonological awareness, phonics, vocabulary, all to do with those sounds and fluency and comprehension. Earlier today, someone was asking me about homework at our school. And we said, well, we're not keen to do homework in, in the senior primary because they need to do their work at school. They have specialist teachers. We want to work on specific things at school. So we're not keen to send things home. Uh, we really would prefer to do it at, at school. But our little guys, we believe that reading shouldn't really even count as homework. That's guaranteed every single day they should be doing some reading. And even a child who battles with uh, dyslexia, if you know that he's already battling grade one and grade two, to read every night with that child is so important. For that child to hear the sounds, to hear the words, to pick up the vocabulary, it's absolutely vital. Um, I, I always go on about it and I could go on for another hour, but it's very, very important to, to pick up those things. And a child, 
also then it takes away a little bit of the mysticism they're hearing the sounds they're hearing the words it's very important tv not as much and it's and it's a problem because tv is too easy it's it's you can you can look away and you can still hear you can watch without listening and you can kind of hear what's know what's going on if you like no I, I believe in reading you have to focus you have to concentrate you have to listen very very carefully so that reading is is very important um let's look at something else this is an interesting one and it's very important and this is the thing you can do at home with your children as well so the font style so font meaning the the, the, the way something is written and obviously these days with computers you're using a font particular font style um with the way that you would type on the computer so there are three fonts that people would say would help a, a dyslexic child so the first one is you, you can see the comic sounds and you can see the a you can see the letters and obviously that will help a child then you've got vedana doesn't matter which one you use as long as you are consistent because you can see if you start using this one and then you switch to vedana it's going to be a different a and that will be confusing so it's about consistency with these things and even Arial because it's a very clear easily read font but there's another font and this font is called Open Dyslexic, and if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's a font that's designed to help people with dyslexia. And it can be found at opendyslexic.org. You can download it onto your computer at any time. It's, it's, it's a free thing, so you can download it, and it will come up in one of the fonts that you could use for typing something that you're doing at home. So there you are, according to that, it, and it was created to help some of the children with symptoms of dyslexia. So at our school, one of our teachers, Mrs. Kramer, the IEP class, so IEP stands for Individualized Educational Program, works with dyslexia quite a lot in the children that, that are in her class. And she put this out there and said, look, this is a free font for people to use in your classes, for all our teachers to use. And because of that particular font, the letters are spaced out, they widen. I'm going to show you an example of that font in a second. They spaced out, they wider, and also any font is okay if you have to, but then make sure that you're justified left because it will space things out evenly. It won't punch up words or letters or make something go to the next line. So it makes it easier for the child to read. So that, that's very good advice, and we can all use that even at home with, with, with the guys. So here's an example of how clear that particular font is. I think you can see it's a very simple font, the letters, the way they form. It's a lot easier. And again, if you stick with that font and you consistently use that in all your work, the child will probably pick it up quite quickly. So that's the font that you can all do. So what else can we do in the classroom? So time constraints. This is a big thing. If a, if a person battles with reading, battles to comprehend a particular paragraph or, or, or book, and they're battling with a chapter, and they feel under pressure because they're taking longer. You saw in that one video where to decode it just takes longer. They'll do it, it just takes longer. So what we want to do is to provide that extra time for, for all these little guys, especially when it's related to, to reading tasks. And it's, and, it's, and it's a feature across the board. All our classes, teachers will definitely give their children extra time to finish a particular task. It's just, it will help them and it helps with their confidence. Same for tests and exam situations. I'm sure you've all heard of in, in high school, children get accommodations, which may be extra time per hour or a scribe, which is somebody just writing for them or a reader, somebody reading to them. And all we do, we're not giving any child an advantage. We're just really probably leveling the play field. So we're helping that child to just be the same as everyone else. We're not giving an advantage. If, if a child battles to read and it's going to take him so long to read and decode what he has to do for the exam, we're not getting it and then takes long to finish the exam or doesn't finish it. We're not giving him an opportunity to show, show his best. So, again, very important that we allow that additional time in tests or, or exam situations. Number four, in, in just simple things to, to use, lowering the stress in the classroom, absolutely vital because we, we have to create a culture in the classroom where we we're allowed to make mistakes. We take longer, we make mistakes. We're not gonna tease anyone else. We, we need to understand each other's limitations or problems in these areas. And if, if the culture is created in the classroom of, it's fine, we can make mistakes, but we're gonna learn from the mistake. I, I feel that's vital and a very important part of, of what we need to do in the classroom with, with, with guys with, with these kinds of problems. Adequate time for thinking. You might think that's obvious, but Sometimes just to have the idea in your head, I have 10 minutes to think and to process this information. What am I going to do first? How am I going to tackle it? 
very important and it helps just to calm the child down and, and lower the stress. And then this is this is a thing that I was a child a long time ago, but I'm sure you all know the feeling when the teacher comes around to you and says it's your turn to come and say your speech in the front of the classroom or it's your turn to read aloud. Imagine if you battle to read or you don't like talking in front of, of, of a lot of people. It's a terrible, terrible situation. It can be very stressful for a child. And I would, I would, if there are people tuned into this and they're teachers, please do not do that. Do not ask the child to read aloud in class. Do not ask the child to say a speech in front of the class or his classmates or, or anyone. If there has to be some kind of a, a mark for a for a an oral project or whatever it is, then then do it at break, do it another time, give the child an opportunity to do it by himself. There are children that are confident, fine, then they can do it. But don't put pressure on anybody else who who battles with these kinds of things. Don't ask a child to read aloud if you know he's going to have a problem. It just will make such a focus on him, and 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 really, it's the last thing you want. So, but if there's a child that's confident, wants to read aloud, so be it. Let that child read more. Then doesn't matter if that's what he really likes to do, then do that. But I would really advise you not to to ask anyone to read aloud or to say speeches in front of everyone else. Number five, you, again, you think it's obvious students with dyslexia should be aligned with an empathic, and I prefer the word empathic to empathetic, teacher mentor. So the word mentor really means someone who's going to guide and help you along the way. And I would really hope that teachers understand these issues work with these people with, with with problems with reading and that they have the empathy to to try to understand what it would feel like if, if, if they battled with these issues so very important that we the right person works with people with these kinds of problems with dyslexia otherwise you need to be empathic you need to be a mentor you need to be there for the child to help the child along and not be irritated or or, or, or battle with the child it's really important that the right person works with a little guy with these issues. And and people at, at my school will tell you, and even in previous schools, they will tell you, for me, it's very important that I have the right teacher in the classroom with the right approach to the child, with empathy and otherwise. It's very, very important. Qualifications are important, and obviously that will be in place, but it's much about the right kind of person to work with children with dyslexia. It just helps them to feel more comfortable in, in the classroom situation. So yes, it's it seems simple, but it, it is not that simple. And and I would say it, it is really it's 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 how can I put it? It's you're drawn to such a child to help a child and to to want to work with such a child. If if you're going to battle and be irritated with these kinds of issues, then probably it's not the right environment because these little guys they will make it difficult for you. It's not a simple day. And sometimes I say to our teachers, we've got ten or twelve in a class, maximum of twelve, and I will say to them. Did you have a tough day? And they'll say, well, yeah, it was really tough. It was difficult. It was a long day. And then I might say to them, but lucky you don't have 30 or 35 in your class. And they'll say to me, well, we have 12 little guys who have some issues and it makes it difficult. So, yes, you have to be the right kind of person to come and work in an environment that we're working. You have to be drawn to it. So something else. We've touched on it before, building that self-reliance, self-esteem. And dyslexia will obviously impact on the social and emotional well-being of, the, of, of every child and every person. I get adults. Uh, you know, you might be to people in, in the adult world and they'll say, I'm dyslexic. Before you can even ask them to, to, to read something or, or fill in a form, and you know that that's been with them for 40, 50 years. And that's, that's awful because they feel a sense of inferiority and they should not. It's one aspect of who they are. And some of the brightest people in the world have had some of these issues and coped with them. And, and, and really made an impact on the world. So I really, when, when people say that to me, I, I don't want them to feel inferior. They, they are strong and I'll give you an example. A guy was working recently uh, on an electrical thing at my home and uh, there's no way I couldn't have put those wires together, worked on anything and it's not an expertise. And this guy was brilliant with what he did and how he did things and what he matched up and, and his work was, I thought it was exceptional work. My dad was an electrician, so I have a vague background in it. And this particular guy did this most amazing work. And at the end of the day, it was just about an invoice. And uh, he said, well, I don't do that. I'm dyslexic. I can't do those things. Somebody else is going to do that. And just in that sentence, the person said to me how inferior he feels to everyone else. And why would he be? He just did the most amazing work. Somebody else can do the invoice. And without him feeling inferior, it doesn't matter. He, he did incredible work. But I do think it's a lifelong thing and, and the impact for, for most people has been very negative over the years and, and I wish it wasn't so because it's just one aspect of, 
of who we are. Let's have a look at the classroom learning environment. So for a person with these issues, we really need to think about some of the issues. So the first one would be lighting. So children with dyslexia, they will struggle even more if, if it's too bright, if it's too dim, if, if the lights are flickering, it, it makes it much more difficult to decode the words and to, and to work with, with, with reading or even spelling. So we need to be very aware of it. And when I got to my current school, many teachers said to me, wow, this is good or this, we need this lighting, we need this kind of thing. And they're absolutely right. Uh, it's very important to have the right lighting for the child in the classroom to make it easier for him. We, you, you don't want to make it difficult, so you want to make it easier. So that's one of, one of the ways. Another one, uh, obvious one, seating pro proximity to the board, to the teacher. Well, if you think about this, say a little guy battles with, with his reading or his spelling and he's sitting at the back of the classroom, far away from the teacher. And teacher is aware that he's battling. Teacher has to make a huge performance to get around through the desk, around to the back, get to that child. And by then, the entire class is focuses on that little guy and his problems and I don't think that's the way it should be. So it should be a lot easier if he's having problems, sit near the teacher, let the teacher be able to help him very easily, quickly, without a big focus for everyone else. So it seems obvious, but, but it is an important thing. That one, control of background noise. Again, if we're talking about focus and concentration and most often dyslexia as well, if there's a lot of background noise going on, the little guy will lose focus. He'll be focused on the background sounds and noises won't be reading, won't be spelling, won't be doing the decoding. Very important to think about that background noise uh, in, in the classroom or outside the classroom even. So, and then another one, and this is interesting because I think we all equate a good teacher with lovely displays on the walls and wonderful things and sayings and, and if it's an English teacher, beautiful things or geography teacher with lovely things all around the walls. But for, for guys who battle with, with this kind of thing, it's probably far better to have uncluttered wall displays uh, or uncluttered classrooms even, but wall displays particularly. So I must say I love going into grade one teachers' classrooms because they've got wonderful displays on the walls and they change the displays depending on what their theme is or what they're working on or what aspect of, of teaching they're busy with. But again, we need to be aware that too much is probably going to be difficult and overwhelming for a child with these kinds of problems. So we just need to be aware of that. On the other hand, bare white walls, probably not good for the child either. So somewhere between those two well-spaced and uncluttered wall displays would be important. Some of the teacher resources to think about when you're working, when you're drawing up your worksheets or when you're working with children, one of the things is color coding. So there have been many over the years, many people have come out with certain color sunglasses or not really sunglasses, but tinted or shaded glasses and sometimes yellow glasses help the child to focus a bit better. There's been no real research to show that they really work, but I'm a believer in let's try, let's see. And some of those glasses have worked over the years, but color coding in general works. So if, if you're working with a particular color for a particular subject or particular thing that you're working on at that time and you stick to yellow and it's yellow cardboard and yellow highlighters or whatever it is, that will help because the child becomes very, very used to that particular color, color coding for that subject or that particular topic. Clear labeling, again, those fonts, make sure that it's very, very clear that the child can see exactly what you mean, what that label is. And labels are good. So the more labels, for things in your classroom, the better it will be, as long as they are clear and the child can make out the letters, make out the words, very important. And then what we've already said, that familiar layout, it's very important for a child to develop a familiarity with a particular classroom, teacher, desk, whatever the case is, very, very important. The moment you change from that familiarity and you change that routine, the child really, really battles battles to focus, battles to, to, to complete the task. So very important to stick to that familiar layout and obviously as part of that consistency. So it must be the same. If you if you want to confuse a little guy that's battling with these things, then every day put his desk and his chair in a different place or give different books or different colors or different things, then he really will be confused, it will be overwhelming. So those are fairly obvious, but I think we do forget them as teachers at times. So be careful when you're working with the, with, with the person with these kinds of, of issues. Consistency, familiarity, very important. Very clear, always remember the story, uncluttered walls if you, if, if you want to, not too many things on the walls. So we've spoken about a lot of ideas to do with 
dyslexia, trying to, to, to help a child in the classroom. And some of these things are things that we can do at home with our children as well. So we're going to take a couple of questions now and to look at maybe you've got some questions that you'd like to, to post. Uh, we've got a message board. And if you can post those questions, uh, we, we can look at those as we go along. I've got three people holding my hands here tonight, so it's it's uh, and they will answer some of the questions as well. So if you'd like to post something either to do with our school or to do with dyslexia or to do with um, a neurodiverse approach, you're welcome to post some questions for us. So let's let's look at a couple of things. So one of the questions that that would arise that that people would what do they say frequently ask questions would be when you when, when a little child comes to you. Do you screen everyone for dyslexia? Do you say every child that comes to school should be screened for dyslexia? So if you take the, the, the concept of screening, we also at our school would like to screen for whether it's speech therapy or occupational therapy. We'd like to look at those things and the earlier you diagnose and the earlier you can uh, screen or, or, or recognize those, those issues, the better it will be. But it's not a question of screening for, 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 for grade ones or grade R's. It's much more about over a period of time, you would come to terms with the fact that this child battles. If you did the screening right at the beginning, probably everybody would have dyslexia. If you did the screening at six months of grade one, probably most children would battle or half. But ultimately, it's only later on that you would get a better idea of battling with spelling, battling to retain the words, battling to read. So I would I would not do a screening early on. I would, as you go along, I would recognize some of the symptoms of, of dyslexia and, and pick them up. So that's one of the things. Screenings can help early if, if you feel that a child has been in an environment where maybe it hasn't been picked up, uh, maybe it's some of the symptoms, but the school or the teacher or the environment hasn't picked it up, then yes, then we'd want to have a look at it. And then people also say, can you test? Is there a test? Is there a test that you can say, if you do this test, you're dyslexic or not? There's no such test, but a number of, of resources would, would guide you to a diagnosis of dyslexia probably but there's no specific test that you could use you could use aspects of tests for sure so another couple of questions which we're taking from the board so what about a child who has dyslexia and is also anxious i would say to you almost every single child that is dyslexic will be anxious because they know they battle I often say to, to adults, we imagine going to work every day, not knowing what you're doing, knowing that you're going to face a day where you're going to battle the entire day with everything. You, if, if reading is the focus and, 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 and you go to work every day as an adult, I'm not sure you'd last more than a couple of days because you would just leave. You'd say, no, this is too difficult. I can't. I don't want to. And yet a child has to go to school every day and they have to focus on these things and, and they will develop anxiety possibly because they are battling with, with dyslexia and a lot of our work is, is exactly that we've got bright children but sometimes that anxiety is, is overwhelming and that was our, our first uh, webinar that we did we spoke a lot about anxiety but but yes it's uh, it, it is it is definitely a question and, and a lot of our work is to do with helping that child with anxiety so if you can post on the chat board there are a couple of questions as to where the school is for instance and uh, yes, we're in, it's difficult to say, but sometimes it's called Santon, but it's Lone Hill, four ways side, if, if that's, if you know that area, um, that's, that's where our school is. Sometimes we also get, I am an educational psychologist, so having done many of these assessments over the years, you would be able to, in a, in a couple of sessions with a child, you are able to diagnose some of, of, maybe a dyslexia and you're able to see it with the child's reading or spelling and even in a sh very short time you are able to diagnose some of those things uh, but for me the biggest issue would be with with a little child and they may be a grade one or grade two the biggest issues would be with the spelling spelling would be a big part of it, it you, you saw that one exercise where you had to try and decode that mystifying paragraph that's exactly what a child with dyslexia, they battle to read and then to spell. So they'll write a word and as far as they're concerned, they wrote down the word and it makes sense because that's what they hear in their head. That's the word and they write it down and you read it and it doesn't make sense at all. You can't even make out what the word is. Then that's an obvious sign and that's that's pretty early on that you, that you would pick up some of those things. Remember our grade ones, 
one of the goals by the end of grade one is that the child is able to read independently, able to add, sometimes even subtract. Sometimes these little guys can already multiply and even divide. But those, those are the main goals by the end of, of grade one. And by the end of grade one, if the child is unable to spell and read, then already there are going to be some warning signs. The grade two teacher will, will, will probably um, confirm that. So many, many issues along those, along those lines. At our school, we are lucky. We've got very small classes, so the teacher is able to take a very individual approach with the child and, and work specifically with that particular child's issues. Not every child has dyslexia. We, we looked at those figures earlier, maybe 10%, maybe 20%. So I, I would say in our school, it's a little higher than that. But anxiety, probably 80%. And that's a whole different story, but related to, to dyslexia quite a lot. So this presentation is being recorded. We will be able to share it with you at some point. If we don't get to all the questions, we will answer them as best as we can with email and otherwise. But uh, you should be able to go back to this and pick up some ideas as you go along. A couple of other questions. What about extra time? How do you determine the amount of time a child gets? It's a very good question. And often it relates to high school more because it becomes much more important. If, if I have an accounting exam and I've got two hours to do it or a math test and I've got two hours or one hour, you know, how do you do that? So it's, it's measured according to probably the severity of the problem. So if, if the psychologist probably normally doing the diagnosis really feels that it's a severe issue, then the maximum time. So the maximum time, extra time that people get is 15 minutes per hour. So if you're in high school and you've got a three hour exam, then you're gonna get 45 extra minutes, which, which often helps whether it's a dyslexic child or whether it's concentration or, or whatever the question, whatever the, the underlying problem might be. So that's, that's how you would do that. So at primary school level, it's not as important. And we like some of the other ways of, of assisting children, whether it's a prompt, I'm not sure if you know what a prompt is. So often a child, battles to focus and they've got a, an assessment to complete or, or some kind of task and they lose focus and they battle to concentrate and then often the accommodation that they have is just a prompt who helps that child just to refocus. So it's not going to be poking in the ribs of the ruler but it will be just refocusing the child on the on the task and on the work. So that's one and then another one which, which we like to use in a primary school is a scribe. So a scribe is somebody who will write and then as we said earlier as well You'll get somebody who, who would be a reader for, for that child. So we, 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 we tend to use those. And then in high school, it's a little different. Sometimes a child may continue with a scribe or a reader. And, and did you know that even in university, if you get extra time at, at school level, you can even carry that across the university for some of the exams there. So it is interesting. And, and remember, we're only leveling the playing field. We're not creating advantages for, for, for these little guys. We're just getting to their true potential not giving them added advantages. It's often people say that to me, well, but this child gets 15 minutes extra and it's not fair, my child. It's not that. And even for, for high school, I used to get people coming to me for their matric child in, let's say, May or June and saying, right, I want extra time for my child. And we would say, mm, has there been a history of dyslexia or concentration problems? What has been the lead up to this? And if there wasn't a lead up and if there wasn't a diagnosis and there wasn't, if there weren't issues over the years, never would we grant that, that, that 15 minutes extra time just because it would really need to be to level the playing field rather than anything else.